I am the butler at Downton. My name is Carson. How do you do, Mr. Carson? Carson is the link, obviously, because he's the one who moves most freely between upstairs and downstairs. He rules the roost downstairs. Mr. Mosley, shall I ask them to come down here and help themselves? Sorry, Mr. Carson. Mr. Mosley thought we might need more milk. Well, get it then. And he, he's an important part of the partnership upstairs. Morning, Carson. Good morning, my lord. And I oversee everything, really. The, the discipline of the house. <clears throat> the tone of the house. What is going on here at a time like this of sober dignity? Have you lost all sense of shame and propriety, sir? What makes you think you're the stuff of a first footman? But Mr. Carson, he was the Silence. One... When Carson comes into the servants' hall, all the servants have to stand. Might I have a word? He's, he's the captain of the ship, really. Don't envy me, Mrs. Hughes. You know what they say? Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. I've had a letter from my sister asking after a job for her son. And... Miss O'Brien, we are about to host a society wedding. I have no time for training young hobbledehoys. Basically, he's in charge of all the male staff. What do you mean you'll have to think about it? What I say? I didn't mind helping you out when you were short staffed. How good of you. But to accept a permanent position as a footman. I, I'm, I'm a trained valet, Mr. Carr. I'm a trained butler. To accept uh, my fall by taking a, a permanent inferior place. You keep telling me it's permanent, but from where I'm sitting, it's looking less permanent by the minute. There were two candidates when it came down to it. One was steady, but not much else. But the ladies downstairs want the other one. Why is that? I don't know precisely, unless it's because he's more handsome. Of course it's because he's more handsome. Oh, do pick him, Carson, and cheer us all up a bit. Alfred's nice, but he does look like a puppy who's been rescued from a puddle. I'm the guardian of the traditions, uh, really self-appointed. You're too tall to be a footman. No footman should be over six foot one. And our job as staff is to make life upstairs perfect. A bouillon spoon. But I thought soup spoons were the same as tablespoons. Ah, so they are, but not for bouillon, which is drunk from a smaller dish. He's the keeper of the flame, yes, in terms of the rules. You do this when the Duke comes and you address a Duchess like that. On a night like tonight, he should act as a third footman. As it is, my lord, we may have to have a maid in the dining room. Cheer up, Carson. There are worse things happening in the world. Not worse than a maid serving a duke. The footmen have to be perfectly attired and perfectly upright. Gloves, Mr. Carson? I'm sorry, Mr. Molesley. You are not the butler here. That is my job. You are a footman, and a footman wears gloves. It, every, everything is done with a, a theatricality. Mrs. Hughes, there don't seem to be any glasses laid for the pudding wine. Oh, are they having one tonight? It's on the menus. I don't write them for my own amusement. Very, very snobbish, very class-ridden, very traditional. Well, won't it bring home rule for Southern Ireland nearer? Home rule on English terms presided over by an English king. Who's keeping the monarchy a problem? Would it be a problem for you to be ruled by the German Kaiser? <laughs> Carson, you're right. I've been very clumsy, my lord. I do apologize. I mean, introducing politics to the dinner table. Oh, shocking. There's a lot he, he doesn't approve of, but very rarely does he show his disapproval. Of course, if Mrs. Patmore wants to spend her time frolicking with prostitutes. Do I look like a frolicker? May I ask who is expected at this precious luncheon? Her ladyship, the young ladies, and the dowager. You have allowed a woman of the streets to wait at table on members of our family. I'm speechless. You mustn't take it personally. Oh, I do take it personally, Mrs Hughes. I can't stand by and watch our family threatened with the loss of all they hold dear. They're not our family. Well, they're all the family I've got. They are his family. Lord Grantham's the... Uh, the, the father upstairs, I'm the father downstairs. And uh, there was a lovely scene when Carson's sitting with Mrs. Hughes and talking about Lady Mary when she was about five years old. I remember once 
She came in here. She's got to be more than four or five years old. She said, Mr. Carson, I've decided to run away and I wonder if I might take some of the silver to sell. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I said, that could be awkward for his lordship. I suppose I give you sixpence to spend in the village instead. Very well, says she, but you must be sure to charge me interest. <laughs> <laughs> and did you? She gave me a kiss in full payment. These little ones, particularly Lady Mary, the firstborn, were his surrogate children and there is that special relationship with lady mary you've always been so kind to me always from when i was quite a little girl why is that even a butler has his favorites my lady there are moments with carson that she breaks down when she can't cope with the matthew's death anymore <laughs> You have a good cry. It's Carson who boosts her ego when she needs it, gives him boosts her confidence when she needs it. If I might be permitted to say so, he wasn't good enough for you, my lady. I watched you realize it as time went on, reluctantly, perhaps, but you came to see that he wasn't up to the mark. I'm not sure if that's alarming or reassuring, coming from someone who knows me so well. Reassuring, I hope for I'm confident that you will triumph in the end. Thank you, Carson. That means more to me than you know. If I touch it, will I get a shock? You'll only get a shock if you listen to it. I think it's exciting. We're catching up, Mr. Carson. Whether you like it or not, Downton is catching up with the times we live in. That is exactly what I am afraid of. For Carson, holding back the tide of history is very important, you know. Oh, please, let us stay, everything stay in 1880. Nor you nor I can hold back time. Unfortunately. He resists all the time, but of course he, he has to give in to it, so telephones arrive. Hello? This is Downton Abbey. Carson the butler speaking. <clears throat> Hello, this is Mr. Carson the butler of Downton Abbey. To whom am I speaking? Toasters arrive. What in God's name is it? An electric toaster. Hair dryers arrive. It's heavy, isn't it? Lord in heaven, what's that now? Maids want to work in shops and live in villages. Both the housemaids have handed in their notice. Were they unhappy? I hope not. No, no, no. One is leaving to get married, which we knew was coming, and Madge has found a job in a shop. Everyone else knows those days are numbered, but Carson doesn't. We may be Yorkshiremen, but we do know a little of life in the city. Hello? Uh, is anyone there? I think this is where we're supposed to be. Carson's as, as liberal as Genghis Khan, really. I mean, he's outraged by Thomas's sexuality. I don't need to tell you that this is a criminal offence. We hadn't done anything. But you were hoping to do something if Alfred hadn't come in. It's not against the law to hope, is it? Don't you get clever with me when you should be horsewhipped. The chauffeur uh, marrying a lady is, is just outrageous. Lady Sybil and I are getting married. Have you no shame? You're a good man, but no, I have no shame. In fact, I have great pride in the love of that young woman and I will strive to be worthy of it. I will not disgrace myself by discussing the topic, and nor will anyone else. I bid you all a good day. Is it really true? Please, I have asked for silence, and silence I will have. He bends to it in the end. He has to. You can't stand like King Canute trying to hold back history and progress because you'll just get drowned. My mother-in-law has been kind enough to invite you to stay and dine and I'll not let you snub her. Now get a move on. I know. You always said he would bring shame on this house. No, Mrs Hughes. For once, I will hold my tongue. 
I thought Mr. Branson's respect for her ladyship's invitation exemplary. Good night, Mrs. Hughes. Good night, Mr. Carson. The romance between Carson and Mrs. Hughes, it was obvious from very early on that there was an affection there. And just when we thought we were getting back to normal. Don't tell me you'll miss me. I will, Mr. Carson. Very much. And it costs me nothing to say it. Thank you. That means a lot to me. I'm the only person she can probably relax with, and I, she's the only person I can relax with, so we can slightly unburden to each other. Do you find me very ridiculous, Mrs. Hughes? Putting on airs and graces I've no right to. What's brought this on? Nothing. Except at times I wonder if I'm just a sad old fool. Mr. Carson, you are a man of integrity and honor. Who raises the tone of this household by being part of it. There was worries about her health, and um, just quietly, you just saw moments that Carson was sort of concerned about her. I just don't want you to get tired. Who have you been speaking to? No one. What do you mean? Nothing. So he was obviously incredibly relieved and delighted uh, to see that she was well. Is it or isn't it? It's not cancer, no. It's a benign something or other, nothing more. <sighs> and then we just see the, the chink in the doorway with him uncharacteristically singing in a perky way. Dashing away with a smoothing iron, dashing away with a smoothing iron, dashing away with a smoothing iron, she stole my heart away. Yeah, Mrs Hughes saw that moment and saw that little... Again, that's a little chink into the private world uh, that we get a glimpse of. And there's a little bit of uh, gentle humour between the two. But if I get my trousers wet... If you get them wet, we'll dry them. Suppose I fall over. Suppose a bomb goes off. Suppose we're hit by a falling star. You can hold my hand. Then we'll both go in together. I think I will hold your hand. Uh, it'll make me feel a bit steadier. You can always hold my hand if you need to feel steady. I don't know how, but you managed to make that sound a little risque. We held hands and walked into the sea <laughs> romantically at the end of series four. We got together with the, the speed of Galapagos tortoises, you know, heading slowly towards each other. <laughs> For God's sake, don't miss. Suppose you want to move away and change your life entirely. You don't want to be stuck with me. But that's the point. What is? I do want to be stuck with you. I'm not convinced I can be hearing this right. You are, if you think I'm asking you to marry me. You can knock me down with a feather. You can take as long as you like. I won't press you. Because one thing I do know, I'm not marrying anyone else. Of course I'll marry you, you old booby. I thought you'd never ask. Of necessity, it had to go at a slow pace, really, because I think it would have raised unnecessary complications. Oh, it's not good. I shall have to look away. <sighs> you see, she is a very proud woman, Mr Carson. I know that, and I respect her for it. And she would never want to appear ridiculous in your eyes. Nor could she. No, but as your wife, she wonders if you would expect... ..that she perform her wifely duties. Don't wives normally perform their duties? Good wives, anyhow. Yes, that's it. I think we've got there. I do believe we have. To openly declare his love, A, to say it to Mrs Patmore, and then B, to, to openly declare sort of a full-hearted love and, and a desire for a full marriage was quite, quite strong stuff for him, really. Well, what am I to tell her? 
Tell her this, Mrs. Patmore, that in my eyes, she is beautiful. I see. I mean, God, he must have been blushing inside. I love her, Mrs. Patmore. I am happy and tickled and bursting with pride that she would agree to be my wife. And I want us to live as closely as two people can for the time that remains to us on Earth. So it's quite nice that the feelings weren't just... He just wanted a, an easy companionship. He wants a, a full and romantic marriage. And, oh, there is a bit of the old romantic in there. With this ring, I thee wed. With my body, I thee worship. And with all my worldly goods, I thee endow. The butler and the housekeeper couldn't get married. They were bachelors and spinsters, so that's why it's so unusual that Carson and Mrs. Hughes move towards each other. Ah, Mrs. Hughes. You don't think maybe you should start calling me Elsie? Not here. Not while we're working. You know, we, we've led a life of, of sort of similar privilege to the people upstairs. I mean, Carson had, um, you know, one of the hall boys would have helped dress him sort of with the collar studs and, and the bow ties and things. So we've almost had staff serving us. So thrown together in a cottage, of course, it's domestic mayhem. Uh, are these done enough? Yes. Shall I fetch the vegetables? This plate's cold, which is a pity. With all the enlightened views of the time, I expect to be looked after. This knife could do with sharpening. Mrs Hughes thinks, A, she, she's not very good at it, and B, she's buggered as she's going to do it. Mrs Patmore put on a bandage, but I'll go to the doctor in the morning if it's no better. How are you going to cook? I can't cook. I can't lift. But it's not difficult. I'll talk you through it. Don't worry. You mean I'm going to cook? It's very straightforward. <laughs> Mayhem ensues. I'm sorry I'm a bit behind. The potatoes may have caught. Uh, never mind. Uh, how's the cauliflower? God. I, I would imagine, in reality, they, they would have spent as much time as possible eating up at the big house and eating at the cottage as little as possible, because, as we see, eating at the cottage is a minefield. Yes. Oh, while you're there, put in the apple crumble. Bottom oven. <laughs> I bet they end up living like students, living on toast. Crumble. Oh, is that it now? Are we done? 